This place is special. It's a beautiful park with thousands of visitors every year. But there's also a hidden story here that makes the Porcupine Mountains what they are today. One that begins a billion years ago with rivers of lava and volcanoes. This story starts about 1.1 billion years ago, when Earth was a very different place than it is today. The only life on Earth was tiny, similar to today's algae, and likely all lived in the water. So there were no land plants or animals here. The ground was bare rock, and it was probably pretty flat. At this time, something big happened in this area. One of the easiest places to see it is at the Lake of the Clouds in the park. But for what actually happened here, well, I'll turn it over to our two experts, Dr. Bill Cannon and Dr. Laurel Woodruff. We're here in the Porcupine Mountains, which is a volcanic structure that formed about 1.1 billion years ago. And it's part of a much larger structure, which we call the Mid-Continent Rift System, which formed again about 1.1 billion years ago. But there was a very uh, major event deep beneath the surface that was trying to break the North American continent apart. And if it had seeded, it would have eventually made an ocean here, but it didn't quite get there. But in the process, it broke uh, the continent in a long arcuate structure that we can trace in the subsurface all the way to Kansas, to the southwest, arcs through the Lake Superior region, and we can trace it again in the subsurface down to about Detroit. That was filled up with this enormous sequence of lava flows. So more than a billion years ago, this part of the world was tearing apart. It was forming a huge valley that filled with millions of cubic miles of lava. You can see evidence of this throughout the western Upper Peninsula. But the Porcupine Mountains in particular, they formed in a unique way. The Porcupine Mountains was what we call a stratovolcano. So it looked like what people think volcanoes should look like. Like Mount St. Helens, for instance, some of us older people remember when Mount St. Helens erupted. This kind of volcano, every now and then, sort of blew itself apart, and then it reformed itself. So some of the rocks that we can see in the interior of the Porkies are remnants of these material that was just blown, blown apart. It makes a big crater, or a caldera, as we call it, and then it gradually fills up again, and then it blows apart again. It's in Mirror Lake, you know, the shape of Mirror Lake. Mirror Lake is probably an old caldera. All the hills and valleys you can see if you visit the Lake of the Clouds, those are remnants of volcanoes and lava flows that formed here more than a billion years ago. And so remnants of domes in different places. The volcanism takes place over a pretty broad area. Summit Upper Peak Harbor. and Government Peak, those are old domes. Those are rhyolite domes. It could have been a single volcano, but it also could have been a volcanic complex. You had a number of different fissures and vents that were putting out different rocks of different compositions. We have the pink rhyolites, the black basalts. In fact, if you know what to look for, you can find some of this evidence for yourself. These are lava flows. And so the rocks that we're actually on are, it's called the Copper Harbor Formation. And that's a, it's a sedimentary sequence that's, after the, the volcanic stage, we have an area, a time when, when fine grained sediments are being laid down by rivers and, and streams. And within that sequence of these sediments, we had some of these young, these basalt flows. And these are, it's a sequence of maybe 20 to 30 basalt flows that are within the sedimentary sequence that are very, some of the last volcanic activity in the entire mid-continent rift. And so these are very young. And even younger than the rhyolites that hold up much of the rest of the porcupine volcanics. And the, the reason the ridge is here is that the, the basalts are much harder and more resistant than the sandstones. The Ice Age glaciers that moved through here scoured out these soft sandstones, made this valley uh, with Lake of the Clouds in it. But the basalt flows, the harder basalt flows, were quite resistant. The glacier couldn't scour them away nearly as, as readily. So it's resulted in this very prominent cliff. When Dr. Cannon is talking about glaciers, he's talking about a period around 10,000 years ago when glaciers a mile tall covered Michigan. As they moved across the state, they dragged boulders and other rocks with them, which scraped up the ground like a huge piece of sandpaper. These glaciers carved out the Great Lakes and smaller valleys like the one with the Lake of the Clouds. But the volcanic rock was too tough 
and wasn't scraped away as easily. Speaking of volcanic rock, you don't just need to look into the distance to see evidence of this volcanic activity. If you visit the park, some of these lava flows are right under your feet. And when the lava cooled, it turned into a rock called basalt. One of the principal ways that we can tell where uh, one basalt flow ended and another began is that the top of a basalt sequence, and again, these were uh, lava that was spread out in, in large sheets over various that country. The lava commonly carries certain amounts of dissolved gases that, that effervesce out of it like a, you know, bubbles out of, a, out of a soft drink. And they work their way up to the top of the flow. And so typically a, a flow top will have these, originally there were holes, uh, there were sort of gas bubbles that, that, that got, kind of got trapped in the gas, so there were open spaces. But over time, they get filled in by min other mineral material. So if you look closely here, you see this, this greenish mineral. That's a mineral called epidote. That's pretty characteristic of the minerals that fill these holes. And starting right about here, uh, their abundance drops off dramatically. So this is the top of one basalt flow. This is the bottom of the next flow. So there's a, a time gap here between this, we don't know how long, hundreds of years maybe, uh, where this flow was sitting here, then another flow came out over the top of it. And if we just walk up the hill slope here, we could go through this uh, more massive material, the interior part of a flow, and we'll come to another flow top. So if you just look at this, just this little face here, I think there are six different flows that, that uh, are quite readily available. If you just look for these sort of bubbly looking things, that's the top of a flow. And the epidote is a, quite a distinctive green mineral, so you can just kind of walk over them and see what, what that looks like. Uh. And if you want to see evidence of those exploding stratovolcanoes, you don't have to go any further than the trail to Summit Peak. Well, now we're on our way on the trail up to the top of Summit Peak. And here we're pretty much in the heart of the old billion-year-old volcano. These are volcanic rocks, but they're very different looking from ones you might see at Lake of the Clouds, for instance. Simple thing is, Lake of the Clouds, the rocks are black, here they're pink. So these are a different composition. The basalts at Lake of the Clouds are rich in things like iron and magnesium. These are rich in things like potassium and silica. So it's a very different composition, and they erupt very differently. The basalts are very hot, they're very liquid, they just flow out as sheets across the ground. Uh, there's no explosive eruptions. Whereas these uh, rocks, and they're, they're called rhyolite, are more viscous, they don't flow very well, they can trap a lot of gas within them, they can build up a lot of pressure, and they explode like most people think a volcano explodes if you watch disaster films or action films, you know, the volcano blasts away. That's what the volcano did here. If you explore the park, you'll find a lot of the dark-colored basalt and rhyolite we learned about from Dr. Cannon and Dr. Woodruff. But you'll also find a different kind of rock, like what I'm standing on here in Union Bay on Lake Superior. This kind of rock is sedimentary rock. It's made of tiny pieces of things like sand that got cemented together. This side of the park formed during a different era, and there's some amazing stuff here that we can see, touch, and interact with like traces of a river that flowed here even before the dinosaurs evolved 400 million years ago. So these are very nice examples of what we call ripple marks. You can see these commonly today. If you go to a beach, you can look at some of the sandy material where the waves are moving back and forth. Uh, in fact, if we probably went to the sandy beach just down here, we could probably see some of those that are forming today. But they also form on the beds of rivers where water is flowing in one direction, not going back and forth. And if you look carefully, you can tell the difference. These were formed on the bed of a river where the sand was gradually moving down river. And one way you can tell is that the upstream side of the ripple is a fairly shallowly dipping surface. The downstream side is steeper. And the reason for that is the river is constantly moving these. It's eroding material off the upstream side brings it up over the top and then it drops down the downstream side. So when you find something like this, you can actually tell not only was the river here, you can tell which way it was flowing. In this case, it was flowing in that direction. Kind of remarkable to be able to look at a rock 400 billion years ago and yeah, this was the bottom of a river and the river was going that way. To 
Today, the Porcupine Mountains are home to all kinds of rivers, not just remnants of ancient ones. You could come down to the Porcupine Mountains' favorite spot, which is the Presque Isle River. You could hike next to the river and follow the water as it goes down the waterfalls into Lake Superior. One of the remarkable things about it to me is that it's roughly a billion years old, almost pristine shales. You can look at rocks only a tenth as old as these are. These look as fresh, as pristine as, as those uh, much younger rocks would look. These rocks are buried quite far below the Earth's surface for a while and then over a period of time weathering and erosion and then the final chapter of that was glaciation which scraped off uh, much of the material down to, a, down to our present, uh, present level of erosion. And if you look closely, you might see the river changing before your very eyes. The bedrock we're seeing here is part of uh, the Nonsuch Formation, which is a shale. It's fairly soft, so it's quite easy to erode and the river is cutting this gorge down into it. Some of the interesting features that we see here, they're a little bit under some of the high water now, but there are these uh, circular holes extending vertically down into the riverbed. These are things that were called potholes, and they're actually forming today, literally today. How these form is there may have been a little uh, depression in the riverbed and a few rocks accumulated in there. And then as the river flows a little bit higher speed, you get eddy currents and those rocks start to swirl around in that eddy. And because the shale is so soft, they begin to wear their way down into it, make a little bit deeper depression, a few more rocks accumulate, they continue to swirl around, and they basically drill this vertical circular hole down into the rock. The Porcupine Mountains have been shaped by volcanoes and lava and more. But all this volcanic activity didn't just leave us with a beautiful landscape. You might know that people have been mining copper in the western upper peninsula for thousands of years. In fact, there's so much copper here that it created a mining boom in the mid-1800s. And a big part of the reason that copper is here at all is because of the volcanic activity of the Mid-Continent Rift. Let's head over to a different part of the park to learn more and see a rock layer called the Nunsuch Formation. The important thing about the Nunsuch in this area is that the lower part of the Nunsuch, so it's 250 feet thick, but the lowest 15 feet are mineralized with a mineral called, a copper sulfide called chalcosite, which is a black mineral. And it's only found in that bottom part of the Nunsuch. And it's only found in concentrations that are, were economic to mine in this part of the mid-continent. So we're standing on a, a geologically important, interesting horizon, but also it's very important uh, economically for this region, actually for the country as a source of copper in the past and sort of for the culture of the area. The miners at the Nunsuch mined the same layer of rock with all that copper sulfide. You can watch our video, The Story of the Nunsuch Mine, to learn more about it. But in any case, how does all of this relate to the Mid-Continent Rift and all the volcanic activity we learned about? And so the copper is thought to have come out of the Copper Harbor conglomerate. And so much of the Copper Harbor is made up of pieces of volcanic rock. And that volcanic rock had very small amounts of copper in it. And so hot fluids probably, as the, as the basin subsided, these fluids heated up, picked up that copper out of the Copper Harbor conglomerate, and then was concentrated in a couple small areas. One of which is here on the east side of the Porcupine Mountains and the other on the west side of the Porcupine Mountains. There were little bits of copper in the volcanic rock from the mid-continent rift, and hot fluids moved that copper into the Nunsuch Formation. There's some evidence that people were here in the Porcupine Mountains as early as 5,000 years ago, mining the copper on the surface. We don't know much about them, but they would have been using that copper to make arrowheads and tools long, long before the Nunsuch Mine or the Carp Lake Mine were founded.
From splitting continents to exploding volcanoes to rivers and streams carving through the land, a lot has happened over the millennia to make the Porcupine Mountains we know and love today. This is a place rich in stories, and they're stories that are easy to find if you just know what to look for.